Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I just wanted to welcome everyone here for our final CAN colloquium talk for the academic year. And we're finishing it up with a bang and a wonderful speaker, uh, Professor Karen Wilcox from MIT. Um, Karen is a professor, a full professor in aeronautics and astronautics and Massachusetts Technology and Aeronautics and I said that. And she's co director of MIT Center for Computational Engineering um, and formerly the head, associate head of MIT in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. She holds an undergraduate degree in engineering from the uh, University of Auckland in New Zealand and um, uh, MS and PhD uh, from MIT as well. Um, after graduating, she went to Boeing and worked with the Phantom Works on cool molded uh, wing body. Uh, Aircraft design, uh, very very cool, interesting problems, and then went back to MIT where she's been for the last 15 years as a professor there at Faculty Member. Um, she's uh, obviously interested in model reduction, multi fidelity formulations for uncertain quantification, as you can see in the bio. Um, but she also is uh, currently co director of Department of Energy Diamond Multifaceted Mathematical Capability Center on Mathematics at the Interface of Data, Models, and Decisions, which bears on this talk today. And she is also um, Leads in Air Force Miri um, on optimal design and multi physics systems. Very active in SIAM. We both agree that SIAM is the coolest place to be professionally. And so, um, and also quite active in AIAA, uh, her home professional society. And that will turn over to Thank you. Right, thanks very much for the invite, uh, for the introduction, and uh, Ms. Earls for finally getting me out here. Uh, it's my first visit to Cornell, so it's great to see sort of this little enclave. You guys have a beautiful campus and a beautiful part of the, the country. Um, so looking forward to talking today about some of the, the work that goes on in my group and uh, there'll be a bit of high level stuff in the talk and hopefully get you thinking about some of the challenges that are out there, some of the opportunities. Um, I'll talk mostly about aerospace systems but I think it's really just an exciting time to be working in computational science and engineering because of the, uh, the various opportunities. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the collaborators who contributed to the pieces of the work in the, um, in the presentation. So TC, uh, who's here, is a former postdoc who's now an assistant professor at Monash in Australia. Uh, Max Binsberger is probably a name well known to many of you. Boris is a current postdoc in my group and uh, Yusuf Mazuka colleague at MIT. Leo is a former PhD student now at MathWorks and Benjamin, another uh, former student and postdoc who's now assistant professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it's primarily Boris, Ben, and uh, TC whose work you're gonna to see today. So uh, I wanted to start off uh, just sort of imagining the future a little bit with you and talking about some of the problems that motivate the work of my group. So as you heard, I'm in an aerospace engineering department, and uh, a lot of the work we do is targeted towards thinking about next generation of aerospace vehicles. And there are really some, like I said, exciting things on the horizon that are entirely game changers when it comes to thinking about how we operate and how we design the next generation of vehicles. So in particular, unprecedented sensing capabilities. This is something that we see in the world all around us, the ability to sense and then what that means for data. So uh, for example, just one technology that's in development that will be ready for vehicles in the next, say, five to 10 years is the idea of a sensor skin that uh, a vehicle could have a skin on it and you would have the sensor skin that would give you the ability to sense pressure information and strain information at every point on the surface of the vehicle at every point in flight. So you think about just what a massive amount of data that is. But also imagine what could you do if you had that amount of data and you could process it and you could use it to drive uh, different decisions in your vehicles. And what kind of vehicle would you even design? And it's sort of, I don't know, the, the image it evokes to me is somehow related to the Terminator movie with the guy who mounts down and reforms, right? This is the kind of technology that gets us a little bit closer to those ideas. Coupled with that is onboard computational power. I don't know if you guys have seen Jack Dongara talk, but talking about, you know, the computational power and how it's gone down until we pick up our phones, which have more power than supercomputers of decades ago. But now thinking about what we could actually put on board the aircraft and the kinds of computations that could be run on the aircraft while it's flying in real time. Again, that changes how you might think about operating or flying the vehicle, but then it also changes what kinds of vehicles you might, might design. The vehicles of the future, are, they already are, are going to be even more so interconnected and self-aware. I'll say a little bit more about this in a second. And then increasing levels of autonomy. Driverless cars is on everybody's mind in society, but uh, autonomous aircraft also a really huge uh, 
possibility, huge opportunity, having your pizzas delivered by autonomous UAVs that come around campus is a very real thing for the near future. I mean, maybe you guys know there are already people uh, demonstrating things like that. All of this comes with increasing demands on performance, on uh, performance from a technical standpoint, but also from the point of view of environmental impact. Reliability, there is so little tolerance in society in general for failure when it comes to things like, like aerospace vehicles these days. Adaptability, um, even imagining the kinds of missions these vehicles might perform, everything from surveillance in a hostile area to literally delivering pizzas and asking vehicles to be flexible, and then somehow to do all of this with uh, reduced costs. So lots of challenges, but lots of exciting opportunities. And I just, I give this one as uh, one concrete example. So this is a figure that comes from a concept that's floating around the Air Force at the moment. It's the idea of an attritable vehicle, and I can verify that attritable is not actually a word, as far as I know, in the uh, English dictionary, but nonetheless, the Air Force coined it, and if you Google it, you will find uh, lots of, of Air Force documents. So what does attritable vehicle mean? It says, rather than designing a uh, vehicle and putting a lot of work into the design and really trying to get it optimal, and then manufacturing it and making it perfect, and then maintaining it to keep it in pristine shape. What if we design really simple, low-cost vehicles, we kind of fire them off the manufacturing, maybe using additive manufacturing techniques, and we don't really maintain them. And so then they're like an old car, that the first time they're flowing, they're beautiful, and they can sprint, they're very healthy, and then next week they're a bit degraded, and they're a little bit less capable, and then the week after they're a bit more degraded, and then eventually they're not really useful, and so we would throw them away. And what's more, let's not think about these vehicles as an isolated vehicle that has to execute a mission, but let's think about a team of vehicles that together, maybe a very expensive piloted asset, together with a swarm of unmanned vehicles, sort of together as a team have to execute a complex mission. So if you kind of put that thinking together, that gets you to really very, very drastically different designs to what uh, we think about today. But this idea of could we somehow reduce the life cycle cost by reducing costs in the design, the manufacturing, the maintenance phases, and that's going to come at the expense of performance, but, but maybe on net it's worth it. So um, this is really an example, and I should also say, and this concept, this is only going to be possible if you can leverage sensing technology and computational methods to actually figure out how these vehicles are attriting, or whatever the verb is for attritable, how they're degrading over their life cycle, right? Because if you don't know how healthy the vehicle is, how do you know what it's capable of? How do you plan the mission? How do you decide whether it's, it's uh, reasonable to fly? Uh, so, lots of exciting things in aerospace. I also want to point out that much of what I'm saying you could remove aerospace vehicles and put in, put in you know, civil infrastructure. You can think about cars. Uh, the revolution is really literally in the world around us in almost every engineered system that I can imagine. And uh, again, this is one of the things that's really exciting to me about computational science and engineering is that the methods we develop are so broadly applicable across fields. And actually, it's often by looking at other fields that we draw some of our, uh, some of our best insight. So I just wanted to highlight a few of the other things that go on um, in my group with very related methods. Um, I'll, I'll mention a bit more about this one in a second, but I also wanted to mention I had a great chat with the students today at lunch too that I have a lot of interest in education and thinking about whether we can uh, bring some of the computational science thinking to education and what these little uh, images here are showing are network models, this one here, a, a graph model of the entire MIT undergraduate curriculum showing how classes relate, and this one here, uh, again, a graph model showing how mathematical concepts relate to each other and are built on each other to ultimately get used in engineering uh, classes in, uh, in uh, engineering curriculum. So this picture here, does anybody recognize this, this domain of strategic international importance? That's right, MIT's campus. This is, so this is the dome where the students do the hacks, where they put the, like, the police car up on top of the dome, the giant dome. Or uh, R2G2, yesterday was May the 4th, I wasn't on campus, I don't know what happened, but one year on May the 4th, uh, this was dressed up as R2G2. Um, this here is the data center, the Frank Perry building. So this is the MIT campus. Uh, notionally, there's sensors distributed around campus, and uh, now imagine there's some kind of an event where there's a contaminant that gets released, 
So the question is, can you collect data from the sensors? Can you solve an inference problem to figure out where the contaminant release took place? Can you make predictions to then say where will it go given the current uh, wind conditions? And then finally uh, take actions maybe to evacuate people. And if we look at the sense, infer, predict, and act problem, uh, uh, flow, of, flow of information from the data to the decisions, then we say, yes, of course we can solve this. We get a nice high fidelity 3D model of campus and we can run our CFD to, uh, to solve the inference problem and to, to do the prediction. And of course the problem is that doing that with our high fidelity models will take hours if not days, certainly not on any kind of a time scale to be useful for uh, making decisions. So this is some uh, much older work where we use some reduced order models to look at this problem together with Sandia, but I really want to highlight the sense and fur predict act flow that shows up in that setting. And then back to education. Um, so another project, this is a current project with the Department of Education where we're working with community colleges to build technology uh, that helps instructors with students in, the, in math and accounting classes where the students have very, very different backgrounds and get stuck in different places in the, um, in, in, in the, in the course material. So again, we're building these very detailed uh, graph network models of the concepts in the classes and now we layer on this questions, assessment questions. So these are the sensors in this problem. Can you collect data to try to sense information about uh, what wrong answers a student give, infer maybe where a student's misconception is, again make predictions about what might help them, and then act, in this case, by uh, either helping the student or giving information to the instructor. So a really, really very different setting, but again, sense, infer, predict, and act. It's sort of this flow of data, data to, de to decision. And then back to the, um, the aerospace examples, and this is an example that I'll use throughout the talk. So in the setup here, we have a little UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle, and it's flying through this complex environment. The blue things are obstacles that it has to fly around. Its goal is to get to the destination, the little star here, in minimum time. So this is a path planning problem. Uh, that's, there's an enormous community of people who work on path planning. It's already a difficult problem, particularly in a complex and uncertain environment. And basically, given the constraints on the vehicle, uh, the path planners will find an optimal path to, in this case, given the objective of minimum time. So now imagine the uh, scenario where the vehicle is flying, and here, initially, on this, this per first part of the, the trajectory, it gets damaged. It gets something, something hits it on the wing, and it's damaged. So now the question is, could you take the sensors, imagine the sensor skin of the future, could you take data from the sensor skin, solve some kind of an inference problem to infer just how damaged the vehicle is, make predictions to now predict what the flight envelope of the vehicle is, i.e. how much load can it sustain in its damaged state, how sharp of a turn can it make around the corner, or how, how quickly can the vehicle pull up, how many Gs can it sustain on a pull-up maneuver put that into the path planner, replan the mission, and then uh, execute. So again, it's this flow, the data to decisions flow. And again, each of these problems are problems that perhaps, uh, the inference problem is pretty tricky, but perhaps we could solve in isolation with state-of-the-art tools. But of course, again, the challenge is, how do we solve this in a fraction of a second or in a couple of seconds fast enough to actually uh, be able to execute a decision on a, on a useful time frame? And so I'm going to tell you about some of the methods that we're uh, working on to solve these kinds of problems. A really, a really key idea, and uh, this to me is where the beauty of the engineering and the math com comes together, is that by considering this whole data to decisions flow together, the entire problem can often be much, much simpler than any of the individual pieces together. If we try to solve just the inference problem or just the prediction problem, it often involves a very high dimensional state or a, a very sort of fine scale solution that we, we need to resolve and solve for. If however the goal is to go from data and then ultimately make some kind of a decision, we can be very goal oriented and we can find a low dimensional, often low dimensional model or a simpler model that captures that essential behavior from data to decisions and uh, use that, that low dimensional model to accelerate the com computations. And of course it's the, the math in querying the various aspects of these problems that reveal to us whether such a low dimensional representation exists and if so, how we, how we encapsulate it. So that's kind of the, um, the, the, the general goal. In my group, we, um, 
we are working on mathematical foundations and computational methods. We're very much focused on design of next generation of engineered systems, uh, although we do do a, a variety of work that's not just focused on design. So I talked about this idea of modeling the data decisions flow. Uh, another key part, and this is something that I feel very strongly about, is that we hear a lot about data, and it's great to have all this data, and from data we can learn a lot and maybe make great decisions, but we should not forget about the physics-based models. And particularly when we're thinking about engineering systems where we have physical principles, and where we need to make predictions, and we need to often make predictions or run scenarios for situations that go outside of our data. So think about designing a vehicle and thinking about failure. You clearly are wanting models to be able to simulate situations that you hope your vehicle never gets into. So it's really a question of models and data together, not one or the other, but both. How do we leverage them both, leverage their relative strengths, and exploit the synergies between them? Third, uh, in so much of, of what I've said, you can see that comput computational cost is a real driver, particularly if you are time constrained in terms of making a decision. So how do we bring principled approximations to reduce computational cost? And then finally, every problem that I've talked about is not a deterministic problem. There are uncertainties in uh, every aspect of the problem. Thinking about how those uncertainties propagate everything from the uncertainties on the data to the uncertainties in the model, uh, and then ultimately how you make decisions in the face of uncertainty is, is kind of the, the fourth big thing. Okay, so how do we go uh, about this? Underlying a lot of what we do is this idea of an offline, online approach. And what does that mean? That means offline. So offline this means ahead of time before the vehicle flies, or maybe ahead of time before you go into a design loop where you want to evaluate lots of different designs. You're in a situation where you can access high performance computing and you have time, you can afford to spend some significant computational time doing high fidelity simulations. So in the offline phase we use our high fidelity models, uh, we run scenarios, we somehow query the models, we might generate snapshots, so solutions of the models, uh, we might generate libraries, maybe simulating different damage conditions, and at the same time we uh, may generate reduced models which are ways of uh, encapsulating that information, and I'll say more about that in a second. Then online, well there's a variety of things that could happen depending on the, the situation. One thing is we could be dynamically collecting data from sensors, there may be a dynamic uh, data stream. Uh, you saw the inference problem that shows up in all of those flows. It may be, and it really is the case actually in the, in the problems I'm thinking about, that we actually don't need to solve the detailed inference problem. As in, I don't need to know exactly where the damage is on the wing or what kind of damage it is. Actually, I really just need to recognize what kind of state I'm in. How damaged are you and what does that mean for your ability to finish your mission? And so that really is more of a classification problem. So once you've classified, then you now have kind of a window to go back and say, okay, now how do I leverage the high fidelity model, the high fidelity information that I pre-computed, uh, given that I recognize that I'm, I'm most likely maybe in this particular scenario. Now you're in a position where you have uh, efficient ways of doing the prediction or the control or the optimization or the uncertainty quantification problem. You're going to see that we don't just use a single model, but we try to use multi-fidelity models. We may want to uh, adapt our reduced models, use the data to improve our models, and we may also even want to adapt our sensing strategies. So lots of things that could go on. But really a key here is that here are the models, here are the physics, the physical principles, and our high fidelity models. And now here in the online phase, here's the way we can really leverage both the models and the data and uh, exploit their synergies. Okay, so let me um, tell you a little bit about some of the get into more some of the details about how we can do this. And I should say, uh, my group over the past years has been working on all the various aspects of these problems, and there's so much to talk about, but I picked two. Hopefully I'll get through both of them. One is around uh, adaptation of reduced models, and then the second one is talking about uh, uncertainty quantification with multi-fidelity models. So I want to give you a little bit of a now concrete sense of, of the uh, mathematical and computational methods behind those. So let me just start with uh, the basics of projection-based model reduction, which is basically taking a big, expensive, high-fidelity model and distilling it into a smaller, low-dimensional system that's faster and easier to solve. 
And the kinds of problems that uh, we think about, are, for, for us typically we have a high fidelity model which is partial differential equation and I find it easier to, to explain or to think about if I think about discretizing that partial differential equation and arriving at a large coupled set of, of ordinary differential equations, or maybe that you start with ODEs uh, originally. So what do we have here on the left? Here's a system that's linear in state. On the right here is a general nonlinear system. So x here is my state vector, the vector of unknowns. I've got uh, inputs u that are external forcing to the system. I'm also going to have parameters p, and I'm going to let these matrices here, a, b, and c, depend on p. And I have output uh, quantities of interest, y. And so again, if I remove the p here, here's the familiar uh, state space system, x dot equal ax plus bu, the state equations, y equals cx, the uh, equations defining the output of interest. And on the right here, the more general nonlinear case. Okay, so what kinds of things and what dimension do these systems have? So let's think about uh, a CFD model, computational fluid dynamics model that models the flow over the aircraft wing. So let's say we take 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes, unknowns are velocities and pressure. And when we discretize using our favorite discretization method, finite elements, finite volume, finite difference, the unknowns now in the X vector are the discretized velocities and pressures. And uh, you know you may have over a wing millions of grid points. So this state, this unknown state here, is of dimension millions, millions of unknowns. The inputs U, these typically would be things uh, prescribed by our boundary conditions, maybe the motion of the wing or some kind of disturbance to the flow. The parameters might describe the geometry of the wing, its shape. Uh, they could also be coefficients of the of the PDE. And then the outputs of interest. Well, uh, that really kind of depends on what I'm trying to do, what's the decision that I'm trying to inform with this prediction. But often the outputs are <coughs> integrated quantities, so lift force, maybe drag moments, or maybe some kind of flow characteristic. So what do we have? We have a giant, expensive, high fidelity model, and it's really big because uh, of discretizing, in this case, the, the PDE. But what we're really interested in, in my setting, is the relationship between the inputs the U and the P, and the output of interest, the Y. And what model reduction does is to recognize that that relationship between inputs and outputs can often be described by a much lower dimensional model than this high fidelity discretization would, would suggest. So how do we go about finding that low dimensional model? Uh, I'm going to show it for the, the linear system because it's very easy to see on the, on the, on the chart. So there's the, the linear system. And what we say is that we believe the state X evolves in a lower dimensional subspace. So I'm going to approximate X as V times X reduced. So V here is my basis matrix. It's got columns V1, V2, up to V little n. So this is the basis uh, and, uh, that I'm going to use to define this low dimensional subspace. And now X reduced here is the reduced state, which contains the coefficients telling me how much of basis vector V do I need to uh, to give me a good approximation for this uh, original x. So I can substitute this approximation into the equations. Now I have millions of equations, but many fewer degrees of freedom. So in general, I won't satisfy all the equations. I'll have a residual. I can then perform a Galerkin projection, or in this case, more general, a picture of Galerkin projection that says, enforce the condition that this residual is orthogonal to another space, in this case, defined by the, the uh, basis matrix W. And when I do that, I get to the reduced order model. And what we recognize is that the reduced order model looks a lot like the full model, the original model. But now the unknowns are this much lower dimensional vector x reduced. Uh, we still have the same inputs, u and p. We now have the approximation to the output, the y reduced. And these a reduced, b reduced, c reduced matrices are these relatively simple projections of the original a, b, and c onto the spaces defined by the basis matrices, matrices V and W. So a very simple but powerful idea, find a low dimensional subspace, project the equations, get a low dimensional model. And of course there are now many, many questions and kind of details here. How do you find V and W? Uh, how do you handle the parametric dependence that sits inside these matrices? What about the nonlinear system? How do you analyze 
uh, the errors that you incur, and in particular, can you be rigorous about, if you give me a P and a U, how close is Y reduced to the original Y? So these are all really important questions that have all been answered to various degrees in the literature, and I'm not going to talk about those details today, other than to say that um, of the many methods that identify the basis matrix matrices V and W, perhaps the most uh, popular one is the proper orthogonal decomposition, POD, which uh, really is very, very similar to the PCA, the principal components analysis that shows up in statistics and machine learning also uh, goes by the name empirical orthogonal functions in the weather community and uh, is basically SVD. And so the ideas of sort of SVD and low rank approximations are kind of embedded here through finding this uh, basis matrix V and V and W. Okay, so that's like in, in one slide, you know, a projection, a projection reduced model. One thing I wanted to talk about was adaptation. So classically, reduced models are built and used in a static way, meaning that in the offline, I query my high fidelity model and I build the V and the W and I do the projections and I have a reduced model and then I give it to you and say, here's a reduced model, go and use it for predicting the, the Y reduced. So we want to think about this case where data may be coming in. So we may have a reduced model but we recognize that, first of all, conditions may change, so the wing may get damaged, and it may be that the reduced model is no longer good for the damaged conditions on the wing. And so now the question is, can we use that, can we build an initial reduced model, but use the data to learn and adapt so that we can evolve the reduced model uh, using a, a dynamic data stream? So this is one thing that uh, we've, we've worked on in this particular context is data-driven adaptation and learning for reduced models. I should say that when I say data, I mean it actually in the broadest sense. So data could literally be sensor data from my, my wing structural sensors, but it actually could even be new simulation data that becomes available. I mean, imagine you're solving an optimization problem, a design optimization problem, and you've got a reduced model that's really good for the design space here, but as your optimization starts to traverse the design space, you're moving further and further from the conditions perhaps under which you built the reduced model and it may be that you're doing simulations and there's, there's useful information that uh, could let you update your model and I look at something like a BFGS an update and a quasi-Newton method as a really sort of elegant example of that in another setting using information that's already been computed through the optimization to update the uh, approximation of the of location. So same kind of idea here with the reduced model. But the key is the physics is still there, and how are the physics there? They're there through those sort of ABC, which are the discretizations of the physical operators that are in turn embedded in the, the reduced sort of model. So there are lots of different ways you could do adaptation. If you think about that flow chart and you think of all the pieces, there's the basis, the V and the W you could adapt the basis. You, I didn't talk about how the nonlinear terms are approximated, but uh, that you could bring adaptation in there. You could think about taking the A reduced, the B reduced, and the C reduced and actually adapting those matrices. Uh, you could also think about constructing a whole bunch of reduced models and as the conditions are changing or as you're acquiring data, figuring out which model to use and do adaptation through a localization strategy. And uh, we've, we've actually looked at, looked at uh, all of these. And I'm not going to go into the details on this stuff, but maybe you can think start to think, you know, ad adapting the basis. It's not just as simple as bringing in data and kind of modifying it because there are all kinds of constraints as to what it means to be the basis. And so then actually what this leads to are really interesting optimization problems. Uh, for example, optimization problems on manifolds um, and some, some really great work out there in the, in the applied math community that we can draw on. So let me show you just conceptually one of these. So think about a, a system. The system has observable parameters, things we can observe, and then latent parameters that we can't observe. So this might, for example, be the damage on the wing that we can't directly observe, but we do have a sensor data stream, so we're, we're sensing something about the system. So a classical approach would say there's a bunch of data, you would solve an inference problem, try to infer those latent parameters, take those latent parameters, throw them into your high fidelity model and, re and build, build the reduced model, build, build, build the uh, projection matrices, do the projections and build the reduced model. And then as things change, try and infer again, get new estimates of the latent parameters, rebuild the full order model, do the projection and build the reduced model. And 
Of course, you could do this, but this is very expensive. These are all the very high fidelity calculations that you were trying to avoid, uh, avoid in the first place. So what we want to do with a, a data-driven model is to say, can we do this flow in the beginning? So we'll build an initial reduced model with nominal conditions, maybe with zero damage. And now can we take the data stream and adapt this reduced sort of model so that we're evolving the dynamic reduced model in a way that's uh, computationally efficient? And the answer is yes, we can do it. And I already mentioned this POD basis, which is built on SVD. So of course, you can go to the literature and find incremental SVD methods, um, things like some really nice work from Laura Balzano at University of Michigan on grass many and rank one updates. So very efficient methods for doing low rank updates to, uh, in this case, uh, we have the underlying SVD. So we can put all this together, um, get some convergence guarantees in idealized cases, saying in, if you were to have perfect sensor information, you would recover the reduced model that you would have gotten to by going back to the full model and, uh, and projecting it. So let me show you a uh, quick, quick example um, of, of how that can work. So the, the setup here is that we have a plate. So this is like a panel on the wing of my, my aircraft. And this is just a 2D model, 2D plate. And the panel uh, gets damaged. And in this case, the representation of damage is very, very simple. It's just uh, modifying the structural properties of the, of the plate. And the goal is to compute the, the maximum deflection on the, on, the, on the plate. So what I'm showing you here is um, simulations. And there's a whole test set, so a whole bunch of different damage scenarios that are run. And what we're looking at is the average error over that test set of the predictions of the reduced order model versus here uh, on the x-axis of the sensor sample. So you can think of this as time of the sensor samples, the sensor readings, the data streaming in over time. And the black dash line here is a rebuilt model. So we start off with the plate undamaged, and then here at this uh, node, a damage event occurs. And in this dash black line, we actually would go in and infer the damage parameters construct a new funded element model and construct a new reduced model. And then another damage event occurs and so on. So the dashed black line is basically the best that we could hope for with a reduced order model, but it's not a viable approach in terms of doing it dynamically. What we're looking at in the red is what happens if you just take your initial reduced model and just keep using it, even though you're now moving away from conditions under which it was, was used, uh, under which it was built. And of course, what you see is that every time a damage event occurs, the model's getting worse and worse and worse until you get to the point that it's basically not predicting anything at all. So the blue lines here are this uh, dynamic adaptation. And so what do you see? So it's a good reduced model. We're flying here in the conditions under which we, we built the model. Damage happens, and initially the model is not good, but now we're acquiring data. And with each data point we acquire, there's a rank one update to the basis and to the reduced model. And then what you see is that eventually when you collect enough data, you're coming back now and recovering the reduced model you would have gotten if you had rebuilt. Then another damage event occurs and so on. But uh, you, you get the idea. So now the data are basically helping you to improve the model. And of course, the severity of the damage, how much data you have, how much time you have, all of this is going to weigh into just how much you can recover. But clearly, you can do a lot better than, than uh, with, a, with a static strategy. Okay, so second part of the talk, and sort of to, to, to tie it in, I've just told you how uh, one way that we can construct reduced models and then adapt them. And actually, sometimes I, I've been, I, lo I love this quote, I know it's overused, but it's my favorite quote. And I actually think that uh, if you had to describe my research in one plain sentence, my research is all about creating wrong models and then trying to figure out how to make them useful. And uh, so I think this, this, this quote from, uh, from George Box really, really captures it. So multifidelity models and multifidelity methods, how do we draw on a range of models and take models that are wrong but uh, make them useful for our, for our particular problem? OK, so here's the setup. So the first thing I'm going to do is violate George Box's quote and say that there is a truth model. So, and, and this clearly is something we have to come back to, but for everything I'm going to show you, there is a truth model, and that truth model is our highest fidelity model, the one that, that we believe models the system of interest. So, 
I'm going to think of this model as mapping an input Z to an output Y. So now I've collapsed all the details of what sits inside there. The Z is like the U and the P. And then inside here might be the PDEs or the ODEs or whatever I'm solving. Let's just think of it as a model as mapping an input to an output Y. And now I want you to also think that I have K minus 1 other models that map the same input Z to the same output Y but they do it with lower fidelity, so they're not necessarily the same representation as the original model. And each one of these models has a cost that we'll call WI. Each one has a fidelity that tells us how well it relates to truth that we'll call FI. And one thing that's really important is that the models don't necessarily form a hierarchy. So where could the models come from? I mean, one obvious place is there could be different grid discretizations. And there we do have a sense of hierarchy, right? Because we have a notion of convergence. But these could be models with simplified physics, and climate modeling is a great example of this, of where there's just different assumptions that you can put into models, and each one of them is wrong in a different way, and you couldn't necessarily rank the models in a, in a hierarchy. They could be uh, some of these projection-based reduced order models that I've just been talking about. They could be machine learning models, uh, data foot models. They could be uh, coming from loosened tolerances and in, in residual convergence iterations. So they could be coming from a variety of places. They don't necessarily form a hierarchy. I just want you to think of there's a bucket of K models. One is truth, and the rest tell, tell me something uh, about the input-output map. OK, so I want to think specifically about uh, the notion of an outer loop problem. And by an outer loop problem, what we mean is uh, when we have a computational application that's got an outer loop conceptually around a model. So in other words, the high fidelity model is, a, is the forward problem. Specify the inputs, predict the outputs, or estimate the outputs. When there's an outer loop, this would be something like an optimization that's moving through the design space and at each design point asking you to execute the high fidelity model. Right? So there's a loop there, multiple high fidelity model evaluations. Other examples would be uncertainty propagation. Again, Monte Carlo sampling, kind of conceptually a, a, a loop, inverse problem, sensitivity control and, and so on. So what we're targeting with these multi-fidelity methods is to say, think about this problem, expensive high fidelity model here. Can we use our bucket of models so that these low fidelity models can help us, can get us fastest to the solution of the outer loop problem, even if those models are, uh, are themselves approximate? And with this setup, there's a few key questions, which is, if you're going to use k models here instead of one, how do you combine the model estimates? How do you figure out which model to evaluate and when? And then lastly, how do you do all this in some way so that there's some guarantees on the outer loop result that comes in? So let me just touch on that last one of uh, guarantees on the outer loop result. Why, why, why this multi-fidelity formulation? So here's truth, full model. Here's my reduced model. Maybe it's a projection-based reduced model. Expensive and cheaper. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, is my reduced model certified? As in, if I give you an input and you go off and run the reduced model, can you tell me with confidence how good or how bad that model is? And if the answer is yes, and by the way, that's a question that mathematically we can answer for a particular class of problems, for linear PDEs of a certain kind with the parameters entering in a certain way, there's a large portion of the community that is focused on this error estimation. So if you can uh, certify your model, that's great. You can go ahead and use it. You can propagate your error estimates and confidently make decisions. Now, unfortunately, there's a very large class of problems for which we can't certify the reduced models. So then the question is, what do you do? Do you use it and hope for the best? And actually, um, this maybe seems common, but this really is what, what is done right now, and if you're designing aircraft that people are going to fly on, clearly that's not, not a good solution. Okay, so this is where the, uh, the multi-fidelity formulation comes in. We're going to give up something on computational costs because we're going to keep the full model around. We're going to evaluate it sometimes. But that trade in computational cost is going to come with the benefit of now, let's say, uh, we're going to place guarantees on the solution of our outer loop problem. And this is really kind of the key idea is that I don't have to know how good the reduced model is itself. If I use it in the right way in the broader context, I can certify sometimes the solution of the outer loop problem even if the reduced models themselves are approximate. 
And again, this is an idea that the optimizers have known for a long time, and this sort of multi-fidelity thinking is embedded in uh, optimization algorithms that we, that we all, all use. So I want to uh, show you one concrete example of how this idea goes together, and it's in the context of uh, uncertainty propagation. So again, here's the, uh, here's the setup, here's our truth model, mapping input z to output y. Now uh, the input is uncertain, so we're going to model it as a random variable, and so now correspondingly y will also be a random variable. So let's think about uh, the outer loop problem. The task is to estimate the mean of y, or after the mean of y. So how would you go at this with a Monte Carlo simulation? You would draw in samples of the random variable z, you would run each one through this expensive model, you would collect the corresponding samples of y, and then your estimator for the mean would be the sample mean. So here's the classic uh, Monte Carlo estimator. The costs of doing that are n, the number of samples, times the cost of each run. And of course, we know uh, that the quality of the estimate we get out, we can analyze the variance of the estimator. The variance of the estimator sort of tells us just how much spread we could get on the results. And we know that that goes like, the variance goes like 1 over n, which is why we need many, many, many Monte Carlo simulations, thousands, to get uh, usually type estimates on, on the mean. Okay, so now think about the setup where I have this bucket of models. I have these k, k models. And again, each model has its own cost. First thing I'm going to do is order the models. This is just to uh, get to a, an optimization problem. It's not imposing a hierarchy. I'm going to uh, order the models, so mi here is the number of times I'm going to execute model i. And I'm going to order them so that uh, the first model, which is the truth model, is called the least number of times, the next model is called the next most next greater number of times, all the way up to the kth model, which is the one that's called the, the most. I'm just ordering the models. But again, the models don't necessarily form a hierarchy. Okay, so now how can I execute this task of estimating the mean of y using the whole bucket of models. So here's what I could do. I could draw mk realizations of the input. Uh, so that's the most that I need. And I'm going to evaluate the ith model on the first mi sample. So the truth model gets evaluated on these guys, the first m1. Second model gets evaluated on a few more. Third model on a few more. Eventually the last model, the kth model, gets evaluated on all the samples. Then I can uh, compute mean estimators. So from each model, I can compute a sample mean. That's these guys here, model, models 1 through k using their samples. And then I can also now play the game. Are these statisticians here? I, I never want to offend the statisticians. Statistics drove me crazy when I was an undergrad because it just didn't make logical sense to me. <laughs> and now I see that like all the things that seem illogical to me about statistics are these like really neat tricks that you can play to get to win. It's almost like violating the uh, second law of thermodynamics, I feel, sometimes. Anyway, uh, so we can play these games, and the game we can play is that for models 2 through k, we can also compute the sample mean by not using all of its mi samples, but using the, the smaller set as well. So we're going to compute these mean estimators from those models as well, with no more, no more evaluations needed of, 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 uh, of the uh, models. Why do you want to do that? Um, because now you can put it all together. So what is this now? This is a multi-fidelity estimate for the mean. And what is it? It's the sample mean computed uh, using just the samples you went through the truth model plus this sum of weighted corrections. And the corrections are the differences in the means you get from model i computed kind of the two different, different ways. And they're weighted by these alpha i's, which are called control variant coefficients. And in fact, what this is, is a version of the control variant, which is a classical variance reduction uh, technique in, in, in statistics. Okay, so there's that uh, multi-fidelity estimator. It's unbiased, um, even if you don't know the error bounds in the surrogate. So here's sort of this idea that you don't need to know how good these guys are because of the way you put them together. The way you put them together takes care of the unbiasedness, getting recovering and converging to the actual mean. But we can now uh, think about the cost, number of model evaluations of model i times the cost of model i added up. And now what we get to do is we get to choose the mi's, how many times you run each model, and we get to choose the alpha i's. So what we can do is write down an optimization problem that says, find me the model allocation strategy and the control variant coefficients to give me the very best estimator for a given 
computational budget. And the best estimator here will be the one with the lowest variance. And I won't go into the uh, details of the optimization problem, but basically you can write out this expression for the variance. Uh, this part here should look familiar. There's a sigma squared over n you get from just regular old Monte Carlo. And again, maybe this wouldn't surprise you. You see the correlation coefficient between model i and truth showing up here. And of course, intuitively, this makes sense that a model doesn't have to be perfect to be useful in estimating the mean. On average, it needs to get the right trend. And in fact, if it's entirely correlated, it's very useful for estimating the mean, even if the, the individual samples are, are not right. So there's this expression for the variance. You can write down this optimization problem. The optimization problem has an analytic solution. The analytic solution itself reveals some very interesting things about the value of models, their cost benefit, uh, uh, sort of their, their, their cost and benefit, and sort of tells you that if you have a model that's not very good but it's quite expensive, throw it away, don't use it at all. And even if a model is really not very good, as in it's not very correlated, if it's really cheap, it might be worth it to use it. And that kind of insight comes out of that out of that problem. Okay, so back to that plate model. Now with four inputs, uh, nominal thickness load and two damage parameters, we've assigned some uh, distributions there. Uh, just to illustrate, here's a, here's a sort of a funny bucket of models. High fidelity is funded elements. Here are three proper orthogonal decomposition reduced models with different numbers of modes in the basis matrix V. There's a data fit linear interpolation model, and then there's a support vector machine. So they're all, all the models are kind of put into the bucket, and you say, give me your best estimate of the uh, expected value of the maximum deflection of the plate, you figure out how to use, uh, how to use all, all these models. So what are we looking at here? Here's the estimated mean square error. So this is the quality of the estimator. How good is your estimate of the mean versus runtime, computational budget. Here's the Monte Carlo. So this is just Monte Carlo on the finite element method, uh, on the finite element model. And that's the 1 over n convergence that we would expect to see. Okay, so what happens if we just use the data fit model? What's the cheapest model we have? Well, it starts to look great because it's super cheap and look at these great estimates we're getting here, but oh no, what's happening here? Here's the bias of the model. The model is wrong. And no matter how many times I sample it, I'm not going to ever converge um, to, the, the, to a, well, I don't have an unbiased estimator of, of the mean. Here's the reduced order model only. And actually that one does pretty well. At some point it will tail out. The key is we just don't know. We don't know how good that reduced model is. We don't have error bounds, error estimators on it. We got lucky here. But now here's the uh, multi-fidelity estimator. And what you see is you kind of get the best of all worlds. It figures out which models to run. It leverages the, uh, the low cost of the, of the uh, data fit model, but it's introducing it in such a way and still doing some high fidelity solves so that we are uh, guaranteed, because again, we have an unbiased estimator, this thing is going to keep coming. And that was with uh, just those three models. So here again is Monte Carlo. Here's what happens if we had two models. I think this is the, one of the POD models. We give it another model. We give it all the models. And you start to see diminishing returns as we keep adding more and more models. That's because we're really not bringing anything new to the, uh, to the uh, table in terms of information. But what you can see is on the order of four magnitude, four is a magnitude, right? If you want a particular uh, level of accuracy in your mean estimate, then four is a magnitude uh, speed up in runtime, which is which is pretty significant. I didn't have time to talk about it, but we've also um, been looking quite a bit at estimating probabilities. And again, if you go to the statistical literature, what do people use for probabilities? Variance reduction technique is important sampling. So we've formulated a. Uh, a multi-fidelity version of important sampling. And this, uh, I mean, of course, there's no theoretical basis on which to say this, but we've done so many problems with these methods, different problems, structures, fluids, uh, so reacting flow, and this four orders of magnitude speed up seems to show up often and often. I mean, the point is that you can really get a lot of speed up if you have decent, decent but not necessarily accurate uh, reduced models and you use them in a, in a sensible way. Okay, so just to uh, conclude, let's come back to the big picture. You are designing your UAV and you say, oh, well, look at all this math. Is it worth it? Do I really want to think about investing in all these sensors and this computation and this math, putting on board, board my vehicle? So there are lots and lots of uh, other pieces to this problem, you know, around the vehicle model and the flight dynamics and everything else that I haven't touched on. But we ran a whole uh, bunch of simulations, different damage scenarios. 
and compared what happens if you did business as usual, which is you have a flight envelope, you get damaged, well too bad, you just plan, continue your mission as normal. And in those cases, first of all, you see a few X's here, that's when we collided with an obstacle, and that's a limitation of the path planning, which as I said earlier, is itself quite a difficult problem. But you can see all these cases where we had structural failure, and that's because the wing was too damaged and the UAV tried to take that sharp turn and failed. It exceeded its structural loads. On the other hand, with uh, these dynamic reduced models and this decision, uh, dynamic decision making, um, we got to 99% survivability. So this is the kind of plot I would put in front of a decision maker and say, okay, you know, what does survivability mean to you? You could start to put some cost numbers on here and decide whether the technology is worth, worth investing. But I think it's really shows the power of the computational methods and what they could do in terms of changing um, what we do with the, the vehicles. Okay, so many engineers systems of the future will have abundant sense of data. I write that there because it's really exciting and as uh, CSE people we should be super excited about that. But let's not forget about the models and in fact, absolutely, if I'm going to be thinking about prediction, you know, decision making, which means scenarios that you haven't yet visited, we absolutely need physics, physics-based models. We need the physical principles in, embedded. Lots and lots of important open challenges. Um, let me just mention a couple. One is scale. I showed you a 2D panel. We can do a wing, but doing a full vehicle, it really is still beyond the scale of these models. So really getting our, our methods, uh, it's beyond the scale of the methods. Getting our methods to scale up is a huge, huge challenge. Uh, I talked a little bit about UQ, but um, and Alex, you and I talked about this, this earlier, but how you think about uncertainty and, and uh, how it affects your decisions is a really, really important and open area. Complex nonlinear systems where a local linear subspace approximation is insufficient. There's a large class of problems for which the kinds of methods I've described do not work. And uh, again, there's some really exciting methods out there that could be brought to bear on that problem. The sensor uh, problem is going to get, in my view, just more and more important and then ultimately dealing with the inadequacy of our models and recognizing that even our truth model is, uh, is inadequate. So with that, let me stop. I just want to acknowledge the sponsors, uh, a couple of different Air Force projects, the Department of Energy uh, program that was mentioned, and uh, DARPA and the, the Singapore University of Technology and Design. So with that, I will stop talking and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions that people would like to uh, yield? So one, one of the things that Yanis uh, Kavrakidis talks about are, are equations-free modeling, in which he will do uh, detailed simulations interspersed with more coarse-grained things. Uh, how would you characterize that work in the context of what you're doing? So I know, I mean, I, I, I don't know it in detail. I am vaguely familiar with Peter Kiki's work. Um, I think actually, in a way, it, it relates a little bit to this question of scale, because I think some of the, the problems that he is interested in are ones where the multi-scale nature is, is really, really essential. And I think this is a huge, huge issue and huge opportunity that reality is none of the problems um, these problems that I've talked about, these truth models are really not truth. And we're not modeling them at a scale that we need to be modeling them. You know, you want to think about damage, you want to think about designing the details of a composite structure on a wing, you need to go down to the next level and just sort of refining and thinking we're going to eventually get to DNS and it's not going to get us there. So coupling, I think, some of those kinds of approaches with maybe more traditional modeling and trying to figure out how we, how we integrate it and maybe sort of starting to think more broadly about not just one model making a decision, but multiple is, is, a, is a path to doing that. But um, beyond that, I, I, don't, I don't know that there really is much strong connection. So there is always an inherent uh, uh, tug of war between modular design, where you can attack each sub-problem separately, and trying to holistically solve the entire complex and you partly made an argument along the way why the latter uh, allows you for synergies and yeah. you don't need to do inference on things which will not matter for your decision making, etc. 
Uh, how, in, in your conversations with the industry professionals, manufacturers, for example, how do you sell them on the increased complexity of your uh, uh, flow, I guess, yeah. uh, of the process? Uh, and the fact that it probably, you know, as a software code, for example, it would be much harder to maintain because it's less modular. Yeah, so actually there's a whole lot of facets to your question, and in fact, Selling ideas and methods and tools eventually to industry is a long, painful process. And sometimes, actually, I think not even I'm, I'm not even the person to do that because my research is a little bit too far upstream and the, maybe a, a step away in some cases. But um, a part so a part of it. Let me first tackle the bit about the the, the flow. We can get all the way back up there. Um, you know, how do you sell the complexity of modeling the whole flow? The reality is that if you break the pieces apart, the problem is intractable. Certainly in, in like the problem is, is worse. Even though it may seem like expanding the boundaries makes the problem bigger, in fact, the problem by breaking them up, I, the, the problem is, is much, much worse. And actually even the whole sort of modeling of the state space system, if you have to solve for X everywhere, that's a huge problem. If you're only after Y, um, it's a simpler problem. Now, how does that then relate to the conversation with industry? And this couples in with my next comment, which is the intrusive nature of techniques is a real problem for getting transition to industry. As in, if an industry person has to somehow pick up their CFD codes and go in and, and find the operators A, B, and C, or their equivalents, and figure out how to do a petrov galukin projection, forget about it, right? Then it's just not gonna happen. So I think that there's an incredibly important role, first of all, for non-intrusive methods. Methods that are really smart about the way they let somebody uh, interact with them through queries, sort of already accessible parts of their code. And that may just be the input-output map, or it may be at the level of residual evaluations. And that's something, particularly in model reduction, the community has not done well at all, which is why I think model reduction hasn't had much impact. So sort of black box, but not not entirely black box, but methods that are more easily adapted to existing codes. And uh, then the other part of it is really good, robust software. And this is not something that my group does at all, but it's a really important part of sort of the broader community and something I think that is getting increasing appreciation for as an intellectual endeavor and sort of like highly recognized research. And so I think it sort of has to be a collaborative effort on the academic side, recognizing that some of us well, have great ideas, but are not the right person to be sort of putting that into into um, like real software. I love the, um, I, seem, I don't know why today I seem to use optimization as an example, but the MATLAB optimization toolbox, all the students here are far too young to remember, but back in the old days when I was young, uh, the MATLAB optimization toolbox was terrible. It was awful, unless you somehow went in there and you knew how to tune the parameters, and you almost never got it to work on your problem unless you really knew the nitty gritty of the algorithms enough that you probably would have written your own optimizer anyway. And then you fast forward now about 15 years, and it's incredibly robust to the point that somebody who has no idea really what what a gradient or a hessian is can go in and call Fman Khan, and chances are it'll work on their problem. So why is that? Some of it's the software, but some of it's also the robustness of the algorithms, and then all the tuning that goes on in the algorithms, and sort of the mathematical understanding, and then I don't know if maybe there's even sort of machine learning tuning that goes on inside. But it's, it's you know, part of the bigger bigger picture. I think we need to get to that level um, in, in some of these other problems. But it's really hard, actually. It's really hard. So you talked about the dim diminishing returns that you sometimes get. Throwing in more and more models, you don't necessarily get a proportional response. And I was just wondering, are there any instances where you use this diminishing returns to maybe infer something about the governing physics and say, okay, these are the types of sensors we would need because we only need models one through four. That seems to be the types of physics and the data that we need to get. And beyond that, it sort of starts tailing off. No, that's, no I, we haven't done that. It's a really interesting idea. One of the things we've thought about was, um, could you somehow use the conditions from that optimization problem to reveal where a new model might be useful? So if you wanted to use it in a constructive way and you, know, you said, I'm going to create some kind of a surrogate say, well, you know, I would like one that's correlated in this region of the design space because right now it's not, so they could be in that way. But looking also at which models get picked, it's actually really interesting to look, I didn't show them I have time, but to look at the bar charts and to say how many times did each one get chosen and then ask the question why. 
and we hadn't, I hadn't explicitly thought about then trying to relate that back to the physics. Um, but I think particularly, for example, in something like climate, where I keep hearing there really are competing models, and nobody really sort of knows which one. Another one is uh, turbulence models, right, where they're all wrong, but sometimes they work for a particular class of problem you don't already know, always know a priori. Perhaps there's some insight, and, and guiding it and feeding it back to the sensor placement problem is also a really interesting idea. Do, do you think that these integrated approaches of Matura and Hutton, that it makes sense in developing sensors for new devices to do that in conjunction with the kind of modeling that you expect to do yeah. with the data? Yeah, and I would even go further and say think about the kinds of decisions you ultimately want to make. But of course, um, it depends on what you're talking about, right? Because the thing with a well, if it's an attributable vehicle, maybe one of the great things is that you throw it away before it's outdated. But if it's a uh, like a commercial aircraft, it's in service for decades. And so there you probably don't want to optimize too much um, because you can't imagine what you might want to do in the future. But I think being more goal-oriented, absolutely. And particularly in thinking about, one of the, the things that's been on my mind is when you make the decisions about how many sensors for example, what are you doing? You're trading cost with something, and one of those somethings needs to be uncertainty. Uncertainty needs to be like a variable in the trade of decisions when you weigh up cost versus performance, but also versus uncertainty. Um, but but actually, I think thinking about about that, and that's I had on the, the slide at the end, the open problem, sensor placement, sensor acquisition. If you had a sensor skin on a wing, that's millions, potentially, of pressure and strain readings at every fraction of a second in a flight. There's no way in the foreseeable future that you'll be able to read all those and process them. So what's your sensing strategy? That in itself is a really interesting question that's not answered by any existing methodology because we've never had that, we've never been presented with that opportunity. Um, and that's a different variant of the sensor placement question. Well, like I said, the answer for particle physics is you have online algorithms that, like, make quick decisions about whether any data is worth looking at further. And you throw away most of it and just keep the ones that you think are going to be interesting that need to have more analysis applied. Okay. So the data stream is not all preserved or further analyzed. A lot of it's just it's cut right away. And what kinds of, what are the names of the methods that do that? Um, well, there's okay. just layers of processing. So the okay. first layer would be called the trigger. Okay. And just, if it doesn't pass the trigger, you don't look at it further. So there's a great PhD topic is to look at, go and understand particle physics, right? Look at these methods and think about how they could be applied in engineering design. You know, so. I'm not a civil engineer, but I'm going to guess that you know you could think about skins on bridges or yeah. buildings, and it's probably a similar question, right? Absolutely. For earthquakes or. Yeah. We have time for one last question, Dave. So uh, when you were discussing this, now you were talking about essentially the, the bandwidth of getting data from all of these sensors, but at least for some sensor modalities, there's another issue maybe not so much for autonomous vehicles, but certainly for things like phones and some other situations, which is energy usage. Mm -hmm. and, I, I wonder, and I do know that there are places where people are starting to think about the trade-offs between uh, having more precise sensing by a very expensive in terms of energy usage modality versus something that's a little bit cheaper. Right? Yeah. So yeah. You know, if you look at the, the when GPS turns on and off on your cell phone, yeah. there's some logic that so when you were looking at uh, these trade-offs between um, different models of the data that you, that you were sort of doing something that was systematically allowing you to decide between very expensive and less expensive things, do you, is there any hope that the same types of techniques would work when you've got adequate bandwidth, but the thing that you're trying to work with is uh, optimizing the battery usage over a set of it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. So, what what was driving in, in the specific example I presented? What was driving the allocation of models there is the variance of the estimator, and so that's sort of a measure of spread of a particular output. But that's that's a particular, if you like it, that's a particular objective. And I guess then the question is, if you come up with a different problem and you say your objective is energy usage and you're trying to allocate, I mean we're talking about a resource allocation problem, then I guess I would ask the question, does it translate into a problem that you can write down that there's a meaningful sort of idea of an optical allocation? 
Oh, I was thinking actually of the so with the so you you have a trade off right so it's precision versus resource spent right in, in the multi fidelity case it might be precision versus computational time in this case it would be precision versus battery that's right this is um, and, and it seems like there's analogies between those two yeah that's really interesting I think even actually you know you're saying this even on board the vehicle when I was saying what would your sensing strategy be. Clearly, energy consumption is a big deal for an autonomous vehicle. And also the thermal load is another big consideration. I mean, you have these sensors, so now you've got thermal issues with the structure. So that could even be a consideration in your, your sensing strategies. Is It's not just about how many you can afford and what information you want, but also what it means for your energy. And then that relates to how long do you want to keep flying and what else do you think might happen. I mean, it's a very sort of complex decision problem. Yeah. We, I mean, I think, you see, we just scratched the surface of some of some of these things. I think we better stop it here. If there's any other questions, I know that Karen is on a flight to catch, but she might have a few. But it's been delayed, and I saw it. It's keep it keeps getting delayed, so I may be here for a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'd like to thank Karen very much.